Okay, welcome to the first of this year's uh, uh, Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, it's very exciting for me to introduce uh, somebody who I've actually known for a long time in academia. Um, and to kick off what we're trying to do to engage people who are, are, are talking in different ways about how to think about organizations and business and issues of sustainability and social responsibility and ethics and all kinds of topics that we're going to be exploring over the course of the coming year. Um, Victoria is somebody who I actually came to know uh, maybe even a decade ago um, when I was uh, running a program at the Social Science Research Council called Business as a Social Institution. And it was a program that was really about how to bring closer together the business, the business schools and the social sciences. Uh, and probably is sort of the, the beginning of the path that which ended up with me being here. Um, and so one of the things that happened in that was I started to uh, work on programs and to fund dissertations that were dealing with issues of business as organizations, but in a way that the social sciences could really contribute to a, a rich conversation about these things. But then thinking more deeply about um, nonprofit organizations, sustainability and social responsibility. Uh, and one of the fellows in that program was Victoria. At the time, she was working on a dissertation on the history of the Paris Opera. Um, and it ended up being a very uh, a wonderful and theoretically rich and very deep, well-received book uh, published by the University of Chicago Press. Um, and she ended up. Uh, also straddling a career uh, at the University of Michigan uh, between organization studies and in the early years uh, also had a, a, a postdoc at the business school where she did a fair amount of teaching in that area and has a real passion uh, for educating students in this area as well. And so it just seemed like a perfect uh, thing to, to, to kick off a, a way of thinking deeply about how we want business school education to be and what we want to be thinking of that's really pushing the boundaries uh, as this business school is trying to do. Um, now, today, Victoria is going to talk about a new project that has, has been a part of her life for the last couple of years on the history of the botanical gardens. And so she's both uh, a sociologist but also a historian of organizations. Uh, and it's a very nice mixture of all of the things about sustainability, social responsibility, and organizations um, that, that I'm, I myself am passionate about. So it's very, very. Uh, a, a wonderful honor to, to welcome Vic, uh, Victoria to kick this off. So without further ado, Victoria, please. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Doug said, I have a history uh, with business schools and uh, sociology and organizational studies. Uh, I am I'm not a card-carrying historian, but I love history. I love cultural organizations. Uh, I teach on uh, nonprofits at the University of Michigan. Um, I teach on uh, macro organizational theory, organizations in society. Um, and in all my teaching and my research, I try to understand how we got to where we are today in organizational life, including business life, but beyond business. Why do we have a for-profit sector? Why do we have five open sectors? Uh, I find that studying historical cases helps us understand how we got to be where we are today. Um, so, uh, Doug mentioned my past research. Uh, I, this is the cover of my book, and I put it up because I have one of the rare books that has uh, really pretty pictures, even though it's on organizations. Um, this is a costume from the 1750s, uh, from the Paris Opera. Um, so in this work, I used my historical research to try to understand an empirical puzzle that can shed light on not only a theoretical issue in organization theory, but also help us understand uh, management and organization issues today. Um, and as Doug mentioned, the topic was Paris Opera and the old regime. And I was studying a phenomenon called uh, organizational imprinting, which is um, the idea that organizations are deeply marked by the conditions under which they were founded in ways that persist uh, well into the future. Um, so I studied that through this particular case. Uh, in my current book project, 
uh, doubling my sample size to two. Um, <laughs> big leap. Um, and I'm studying a different time and place, but I'm studying the same issues uh, in some ways, and, and my approach is similar. Um, this project focuses on New York in the 19th century, uh, at, at the beginning and the end of the 19th century. Uh, specifically at the beginning of the 19th century, on this man's project. I hope you all can see it. Um, this man you've never heard of, I'm guessing. Raise your hand if you have. Uh, his name was David Hasek. No. I wouldn't have expected you to have heard of him. In, well, he is famous for one thing, or by association. He was Alexander Hamilton's attending physician at the duel. He did not save Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> um, David Hasek was born in Manhattan. 1769, and he had a dream by the time he was, by the 1790s after New York's occupation by the British was over, the Revolutionary War was over, and he had studied medicine in uh, England and Scotland, and at Columbia, and at Princeton, and at Penn, um, and he had a dream of establishing a fabulous green space at the heart of Manhattan. And in this green space, he wanted to put a botanical garden. And he bought 20 acres of land in 1801 with his own money from his medical papers <coughs> and established this botanical garden. He got uh, correspondents and explorers from all over the world to send him specimens for this garden. He wanted to teach medical students pharmacology <coughs> out of real, off real plants rather than out of books. So he established this wonderful green space. Among his correspondents, people who sent him plants were Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Hamilton brought him specimens. And he established this amazing green space. Um, now you can see there's an amazing green space at the heart of Manhattan in our contemporary map. Um, it is not the green space that David Hosick established. Uh, everybody knows what this is, correct? Central Park. Uh, so where was David Hosick's green space? This is his conservatory he built in 1804, 180 feet long, and it was right there. Does anybody know what's there today? Uh, it's like 42nd Park. Street. Metropole. Gravesty Park. That's too far south. Center was built on the site of, and I will argue later, because of David Hasek's initial vision. It would be 90 years before, after David Hasek founded his garden, which was defunct by 1810, it would be 90 years before a botanical garden was established in New York City. And it was by this man. Rather less uh, dapper than David Hosick, uh, more of a researcher, uh, scientist type. His name was Nathaniel Britton. And he too, like Hosick, was a Columbia professor of botany and medicine. And he decided now is the time to establish a botanical garden in Manhattan. And when we look at the map of New York, we can see that his green space is still here today. And when you go there, this is what you see. The New York Botanical Garden. Anybody been there? 250 acres, including 50 acres of virgin forest, never cut down, ever. Uh, Lenape Indian uh, uh, inscriptions still on the stones there. Um, so why did one man succeed? where the other failed. When we look at these projects side by side, we can see that they actually have very similar profiles and we'll get a little further down. Uh, David Hasek, in 1801, purchased 20 acres, built his conservatory of land collection. He 
had to fund it himself. Columbia couldn't give him the money. The state wouldn't give him the money. The city wouldn't give him the money. Finally, he got rid of the garden. He couldn't keep it up anymore. The state purchased it from him. And they gave it to Columbia. Columbia was asking for money. And they gave it to Columbia. And Columbia let it languish. And the garden collapsed. In 1985, Columbia sold. So, one important step. In the 1920s, Columbia leased the land to John D. Rockefeller Jr. So he could build Rockefeller Center. But they didn't sell it. In 1985, they sold the land for $400 million. Uh, and Rockefeller Center uh, turned over to the Rockefeller Group, and then that later was sold to a Japanese company after that. Um, Nathaniel Britton, by contrast, uh, got parkland donated, 250 acres donated by the state. He was massively successful in fundraising in ways I'll, I'll talk about. Um, the garden has never been out of operation, the New York Botanical Garden. And in a stroke of painful irony, their budget is approximately uh, what Hasek um, helped Columbia make in 1985, um, $400 million. So why did one of these projects succeed and the other fail? Organizational sociologists and management theorists have in the past two decades turned in increasing numbers to the concept of institutional entrepreneurship. This is uh, an idea that was first formulated by uh, the sociologist Paul DiMaggio in 1988 in a much cited article. Um, he wrote there, new institutions arise when organized actors with sufficient resources, called institutional entrepreneurs, see in them an opportunity to realize interests that they value highly. And this was very important for the field of institutional analysis of organizations because prior to this, institutional analysis had really focused on the stability of organizations, on uh, institutions, on the continuity provided by institutions to organizational life. So the routines of organizational life, the taken for granted assumptions about how, how we should do things, the continuity uh, that is the water that we swim in as uh, members of organizations. And the problem was, for institutional theorists, was that there was no explanation of how these institutions actually emerged in the first place. Um, so this concept, institutional entrepreneurs, was proposed as a way to try to explain how we end up with new institutions. Um, two key concepts in this research on institutional entrepreneurs. One, the organizational field. Uh, the idea that not only an industry with uh, similar organizations matters when we look at organizations in society, but also all kinds of other organizations that regulate, that uh, compete, that uh, produce consumers, that produce taken for granted assumptions about the organizations in, in the field. Uh, these constitute that organizational field in which institutional entrepreneurs are considered to be active. And the other key concept uh, for this literature is institutional logics. This is the taken for granted, uh, resilient social prescriptions, sometimes encoded in law, specifying the boundaries of the field, its rules of membership and the role identities, and appropriate organizational forms of its constituent communities. <clears throat> so these two concepts are key to, to literature arguments about how institutional entrepreneurs actually change institutions. And the literature on institutional entre entrepreneurship has therefore taken institutional entrepreneurs to be creative agents who, ha are, who occupy social positions where they can mobilize resources. Uh, they're skillful agents. They can recognize problems or opportunities in their environment. Uh, and they can mobilize the resources required to institute the change there. That change might be uh, within an, an existing field, efforts to change routines or to change uh, taken for granted assumptions about how uh, expert knowledge is produced, for example. Um, or institutional entrepreneurship has been looked at as taking place between fields, where, for example, in the literature on social entrepreneurship, uh, there's 
many organizations that are synthesizing a market logic with a more nonprofit logic to try to deliver services more efficiently. So institutional entrepreneurship can happen within a field or at the boundary of fields. Um, and the key research questions then are how, the key research question is how do institutional entrepreneurs actually affect change? This is both a theoretically interesting question and a practically important question. If you want to change the world, how do you do it? What levers do you use? What tools? What resources? Um, for organizational sociologists and, uh, and management theorists, trying to understand how the social world changed, how the world of organizations change, is one of the key uh, abiding questions in institutional research. So what are the actions? The literature has converged on four typical actions uh, from institutional entrepreneurs that tend to lead in these studies to, and we're talking about dozens and dozens of studies, usually case studies, single case studies, uh, to the generation of lasting institutional change. The problem or opportunity identification, what needs to be changed? The generation of a template. What tool, what uh, existing organizational forms or rules or behaviors that we have drawn to propose to solve the problem or meet the opportunity? Skillful framing, a strong emphasis on, in the literature on successful institutional entrepreneurs is that they need to be good at framing their project towards potential stakeholders and supporters. Um, and finally, institutional entrepreneurs who are successful are typically seen as being good at binding their organization, their, their new form, their new practice, their new routine to existing, powerful, legitimate actors, routines, uh, actors, organizations, and practices, so that they stick, so that there's actually institutionalized change. So what I want to do is take you through these two entrepreneurs and their institutional entrepreneurs and the steps and show you that they both did all of these things that the best successful institutional entrepreneur is supposed to do. Yet one failed, the other succeeded. Um, now my research is based in uh, archival documents. Um, I draw on um, letters, correspondence, uh, administrative documents of the two gardens, uh, newspaper articles from the time, um, a whole range of archival sources. Uh, this means that my data are words. And I have to make an argument through these words. Um, it means that I'm about to throw up a lot of historical quotes I'm going to move through them quickly, um, and I hope that you will see. I'll summarize them at the end of the table so you can see them side by side. Um, but I'm going to take you through quickly the two entrepreneurs and the four <coughs> steps that they both took. The first was problem or opportunity identification. So Hasek had a very strong interest in medicine. He was a professor at Columbia by 1795. He had studied as I mentioned, in uh, England and Scotland, which were the seats of learning for medicine in, uh, in the 1790s. And he came back, he got his job at Columbia, which was downtown at Park Place at the time in one building. Um, and he started teaching medical students. And he found that they were uh, bored, they were unengaged, they were having trouble actually learning out of the several books of plates that he had brought back from Europe that actually had pharmacological, uh, that had plant pictures that he could he could show them uh, the properties of, uh, of medicinal plants. So he came back and he wrote to, he tried to teach for a little while, and then he wrote to the trustees at Columbia, his bosses, and he said, I'm having trouble teaching these students out of books. I need to be able to teach them, as they do in Europe, out of a botanical garden. <coughs> Bear in mind that by this point in Europe, the major cities had had botanical gardens for hundreds and hundreds of years. In some cases, five, six, seven hundred years. Botanical gardens were the way you taught medicine in Europe, which was considered the cutting edge for medical instruction, even for American uh, citizens. 
So he says to the trustees, the obvious and only effectual remedy would be the establishment of the botanical garden. Um, they said they voted 300 pounds a month, but then they had a year for him, but somehow they never managed to pay it. Um, so next is template generation. What template, what blueprint are you going to use to create this botanical garden in the 1790s? You're going to draw on the European established template. So he proposes that he's going to organize uh, his garden according to two dominant uh, uh, organizations of the plant species that are current in um, Europe. So Linnaeus and Jussieu. Okay, template generation. So next, framings. He's got to frame this in a way that's going to gain the support uh, of the people with the money to help him finance it. Um, first framing is medicine. Of course, he's trying to teach medical students. So he says, all of these wonderful European cities, in fact, have wonderful botanical gardens. And that's, in fact, why they're so famous and celebrated. And we need that, too, in this young republic. We, too, need to be worthy of celebration in our educational system. So he tries that. And his other framing that he tries is agriculture. In the young republic, the uh, uh, abiding concern was the independence of the republic from Europe. The more you learn about American agriculture, the more uh, progress in that branch of knowledge, the more independent the young United States would be able to be. So he's making a strong political argument. Yes? Are the framing uh, distinctions that you're making applied by you, or did he actually say, here are the reasons we should do it, agriculture? He, he did them, it's, it's both. He didn't say, he didn't put a heading that says uh, medicine. He wrote to different constituencies depending on what he thought their concern would be, what would motivate them. And medical knowledge, that was important for, of course, for his fellow medical professionals, um, many of whom, most of whom was also studied in Europe and knew what he was talking about. <coughs> it was also uh, important, there were play, uh, outbreaks of yellow fever in Manhattan at the time, and there was great concern that the medical knowledge was not where it needed to be. Um, the rich fled to their country estates and the poor died in droves in Manhattan. And there was, um, there was a great political will to try to improve medical, they were, they were founding medical societies, uh, state level medical societies and so on. But there were plenty of people in the state legislature who didn't care about medicine who were really concerned about the, the agricultural progress. So he's trying, to, he's trying to navigate to reach these different possible stakeholders with these different arguments. Um, and we'll see a little bit later the ways in which this did or did not work. Does that answer your question? Yes. So essentially he's going to different venture capitalists and framing his arguments as any entrepreneur would. And here's how it will benefit you and uh, yes. need venture capital. Yes. Um, in this case, the, the capital was both uh, financial and uh, another kind of capital he needed was legitimacy, mm -hmm. uh, and which, of course, any entrepreneur, entrepreneur needs. But an institutional entrepreneur needs it more than anybody else because he's trying to change something in society. And what he's trying to change here is not just medical education. He's introducing a form, a, an organizational form that's unfamiliar to most people in the United States, uh, including most politicians. So it's a little tougher road to hoe, no pun intended. Um, um, to try to persuade people of the need of this new institution, not just I need to receive money from oh, geez, I'm doing that. that was not a pun intended either. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so the, um, the next step that institutional entrepreneurship literature identifies as, as crucial so you say you get your venture capital, but you also have to bind this. To make an institution stick, you have to bind it to things that are already going on, uh, to practices, to organizations that are already highly legitimate. 
to key actors, to the most powerful actors. Um, so, Hasek first binds this guard, tries hard to bind it to teaching at Columbia, which was the main point of it. So, he starts publishing notices in, uh, or has Columbia published notices saying that Dr. Hasek proposes to unite his lectures on materia medica um, to those lectures, a short course of botany, which will be illustrated by living plants. So, he's teaching summer session courses up at the garden, and in the winter, he's bringing specimens uh, to the classroom down at Park Place. Um, he tries to bind to key actors. Now, Manhattan, in the early 19th century, Anybody have a guess about the population? 200,000. Smaller? 60,000. This is a place where if you walked out of your house on Lower Broadway and you were Alexander Hamilton, you would be very likely to run into Thomas Jefferson. Or David Hosek, but you might be less excited. Um, <laughs> in fact, the reason the capital is here, in Washington, as some of you must know, is that there was a chance meeting that led to a dinner party at Thomas Jefferson's house in a building that, alas, no longer exists in Lower Manhattan. There's a big plaque on the horrible, hideous 1970s structure uh, where Hamilton and Adams and Jefferson struck a deal uh, to do with supporting Hamilton's plan for assuming the, the debt after, of the states after the uh, Revolutionary War. And in exchange, the capital was moved to Washington. Um, so a lot happening in this tiny place in Lower Manhattan. And it was easy to run into and to know very famous people. Um, in fact, the most powerful people in the entire United States at the time. They were all concentrated in this couple of blocks. Um, Hasek was not himself uh, as powerful as these politicians, but he had uh, a very well-known salon where he um, entertained the, the politicians, the artists. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote about going to the salon. He was really in the thick of things, and he bound his project to these actors. The governor uh, of the state of New York stood up in front of the joint assembly, joint um, session, at the beginning of the session in 1806, and said, I've been to this place. You should vote to support it. This is binding to somebody pretty, pretty powerful. Um, it didn't happen, and I'll come back to why in a moment. And that's, that's one of the big puzzles uh, I want to try to explain. Is why, if you're so centrally positioned, you've got really powerful framing and really powerful friends, you can't make it happen. And then this man could make it happen. Uh, the question is, was it a matter of individual skill? And I, predictably, am going to argue that it was not. Uh, so let's look at Britain quickly. Nathaniel Britton was also a Columbia professor of botany. Um, he earned his PhD in the 1880s, and in 1885, he went on his honeymoon uh, with a fellow botanist he had married, uh, Elizabeth Knight, to the Royal Botanic Garden in Kew, the world's greatest botanical garden at the time. Um, you would probably still say it's the world's greatest botanical garden. Um, they went on their honeymoon, and while they were there, they discussed the possibility of having such a garden for New York. And they came back, and Nathaniel Britton proceeded to uh, do the same framing, um, uh, the same lobbying activities, the same attempts to combine this organization. And sorry, let me go back to this. Uh, so he, the first thing he does is publish a an appeal for a botanical garden, and he. Uh, you can see some of the terms he's, and the ways he's trying to frame it. It's going to be an, uh, an academic research uh, facility. Um, it would win the lasting reputation for itself and its founder, both in this country and abroad. Um, so he's, he's beginning to identify this problem. If he sees it more as an opportunity than, than Hasek. Hasek was complaining about not being able to teach medical students. 
written this saying this is a wonderful opportunity for the country. Um, the template is very, uh, very explicit about, he's more explicit in fact than, um, going back to your question, than Isaac was. He says, here are the, here are the four uses. And um, the first is, hence the earlier reference to Cornell, um, it's going to be scientific and educational. Also important, pharmaceutical and horticultural. And lastly, it's pretty. Public can go and stroll it. Okay, so very clear cut uh, framing. Uh, sorry, template. Um, so he's drawing in this template on exactly what Q was doing and was famous for. And as we'll see in a second, he and his supporters constantly invoked Q um, as their model. So he says, to serve adequately the various uses here indicated, a botanic garden requires its own spacious site, cites the amount of space that Q has. Uh, that should be good enough for New York. Um, and soon the press is taking up this, uh, this language. He's, he's managed the, to shift the framing into the public sphere. Yeah. You mentioned before that he published it, and, and so there's a reference. Is this a, a, a popular place he published it, or was it an academic journal? Uh, no, it wasn't an academic journal. They circulated it to, they published a pamphlet. He published a pamphlet and then circulated <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of copies to everyone he knew in New York City. So he, he yeah, he was not, he was not keeping it uh, under a, a bushel. Um, so, Soon the press is taking up this, uh, why should not New York, New York's botanical garden aim to be in time to North America what he was to Europe? Um, he, like Hasek, is very centrally placed. Now New York's a much bigger city, but Britain is a relative of uh, the Vanderbilt family. He um, is very close to President Seth Lowe of Columbia, who would soon be mayor of New York, and knew everybody who mattered. Um, especially the, the four key people, uh, key businessmen we'll be looking at in a second. Um, and so the incorporators, and those are the guys I'll tell you about, um, have their meeting at the office of Chris and Steph Lowe. So now Columbia is really implicated in this project. Um, binding to Columbia. Again, courses are being taught there. There's a formal agreement now uh, to allow Columbia to teach its courses at uh, it's botany and medicine courses at the garden. Binding to key actors. He's, uh, Van, uh, Britain is good friends with uh, two judges who help him drop the, uh, the papers to lobby the state for the act of incorporation and to get 250 acres of Bronx parkland. And the state act of incorporation says if you can get $250,000 of private funds raised, then we will give you 250 acres of bronze for Very different situation from Hasek having to buy it on his own. These are the men who were the incorporators who went to Seth Lowe's office that day. Can you imagine the parade of these people into and Seth Lowe's office? At that point, Columbia had moved from Park Place. It was now in the 40s and Madison. It's not yet up where we know it today in Morningside Heights. Um, that was done under Seth Lowe's um, direction in, uh, at around the same period, actually, 1880s. So these four men march into Cephalo's office. They pledge $25,000 each, and they get deeply involved in this. Um, this is a letter that uh, the secretary of the garden, as they're building the administration, writes saying, Vanderbilt's working on the big subscriptions. Morgan." Um, you know, Vanderbilt's working on the little subscriptions. Morgan is trying to get the big ones, and he's trying to keep a secret that Vanderbilt's willing to accept little ones because we don't want the big, the, the wealthy New Yorkers not to give as much as they possibly can. So we're keeping those two. So you have these major players in American business, arguably the, the most important, powerful men in the 19th century, in the, in the second half of the 19th century, in the United States, fundraising for this botanical garden. So Britain has been highly successful in getting his project bound to these powerful actors. Okay, so when we look at these two things side by side, these two projects, we can actually see that they both took the same steps. They made 
They made arguments that were appropriate for their times. They bound to really prominent, powerful people, um, Columbia professors. Um, and one failed miserably, and the other succeeded spectacularly. If we looked, as so many studies of entrepreneurship do, and institutional entrepreneurship particularly is not guilty of this, and I myself have contributed uh, to this way of thinking about institutional entrepreneurship in the past, if we look at cases of success without looking at cases of failure, then we can attribute success very easily to that skilled entrepreneur. We can say, this is how you do it. If you want to found a massively successful nonprofit organization, this is how you do it. But when we look at these two projects side by side, and we see that they did the same things, they took the same steps, we have to ask, what else is going on? And that's a question that has not been asked in this literature. There's a celebration of the heroic institutional entrepreneur who can change the world through effort, skill, and strategy. So, now of course there's a backlash, and so often in, um, in literature when there is a paradigm that takes off and is very you know, successful in explaining a lot, people after a while will start to say, maybe this isn't the whole picture. Um, and Walter Powell and his co-author Jeanette Kalibas, Walter Powell, Powell is one of the founders of the field of uh, institutional analysis of organizations, has uh, begun to suggest that maybe we are too focused now on this. We, we went from, from institu the institutional level, the stability of institutions, shaping, guiding, structuring organizational behavior, and now we've gone too far in the other direction. Now institutional entrepreneurs are running around transforming the world at will. The reality is somewhere in between. And what we've lost is an emphasis, an attention to macro level political, cultural, economic forces that actually have these people in their grip. Yes? Just a quick clarification. Can you just talk a little bit about what, what he means? What's the difference between macro factors and structural forces? Well, okay. so. I actually I have a little problem with that part. He, he is saying his use of structure here is, is um, when he is talking about uh, structural forces, we think often of structural forces as actually shaping, changing. Uh, he thinks of structural forces as totally static. So he's saying we think of structural of macro factors as static, as unchanging. Institutions are unchanging. And then the micro level is where the change comes. And he's saying, actually, the which is a little bit counter, counter to, it's a, a slightly unusual way to use the term structural, right? Because we would think of structural as more processual, is what I'm guessing. Um, so what he's saying is that there are changes happening on the macro level. It's not that we have uh, a stable background and then we're doing this individual activity. We need to look at the changes that are going at the macro level, uh, whether they're in the same um, the same direction as the institutional change that is being um, attempted at the micro level. May I ask? Yes. The two uh, episodes are separated by 50, 60, 70 years. Yes. Does that make a difference also? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, in all kinds of interesting and ways. The was, who is more Yes. Yes. You're about to make my argument for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so not only there are two ways to ask that question, and one of them I'm gonna I'm gonna not let anybody ask yet because we can discuss it later. Um, and that is, well maybe this Nathaniel Britton just had the advantage because people had heard of the first garden and so now it wasn't as that's a liability of newness for Hyde. <coughs> and the second by the time the second garden comes along, maybe the form is a little more familiar, but I think there's much more going on. So I'm going to shut down the liability of newness objection or question. But this is an important point. This is historical difference. Yes. Just a comment. It strikes me as the same thing is happening with the views of the solitary inventor. That 
uh, now we look back and we see you don't normally have to have the invention like the telephone, but you have to have it at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, there are all kinds of, and we can talk about the uh, extensions, parallels to uh, to technological innovation. Um, even what what I what I on a on a tiny level, I'm nor you're an inventor, but I noticed that as I start to correspond with some of my colleagues. Um, Howard Aldrich, for example, I find that we're making the exact same arguments, and we swap papers and say, oh my god, you wrote my paper, I wrote this. And, um, and it's that moment when people start to think in, in particular, along particular lines, and it happens in, in very far flung places, uh, usually in more consequential ways than just academics writing the same paper. Um, but the history question, the, fit, the, the difference in time, I think that difference is everything. That's, that's what, what happened between Hasek's era and Britain's. Doesn't mean that Hasek, that Britain wasn't skilled and savvy and talented. But he had a lot more to draw on and a lot of historical processes actually moving in his direction. And I want to, I want to talk about this. Um, these are the processes I want to talk about. And I think this is uh, this is sort of what you're getting at uh, emergence of new products. <coughs> but professional professionalization of the field of botany, the growth in organizational resources. I'm going to talk about the change of the home institution. Columbia has completely transformed over the course of the 19th century. Uh, emergence of new funding models. I'll talk about that. A whole range of gilded age institutions are being founded that give Britain leverage that Hasek didn't have in the early republic when there was no no model for how to set up an organization like this. Now we know. We go, we file, and we get 501c3 status, and we try to find an angel investor, and uh, there simply wasn't in the early republic that kind of model out there. It just wasn't. It wasn't. The country was too young. Um, so I'm going to talk about that briefly, and then changes in the material plan. And I want to emphasize that all of these changes are not simply resources that can be harnessed. They're not just more, more tools that an that a institutional entrepreneur can grab. They're happening beyond the entrepreneur's control. Whether they can be surfed in a way or ridden like a wave is, is one thing. But they are processes, macro level processes, that have an enormous impact, I believe, uh, is, that's suggested by this comparison on the outcomes of institutional entrepreneurship projects. So, so let me talk quickly about, um, how are we doing on time? Okay. okay. Um, the early republic, botany was a gentleman's pursuit. You did it on the side of being uh, a gentleman. You did, if you were a lawyer, you didn't say you were a lawyer. You were a gentleman who practiced law. And when you didn't want practicing law, you might go out in your garden and on your country estate and cut open some plant specimens and look at your books and learn about, uh, about botany. Uh, there were some professional botanists, but they were Europeans sent over to get North American specimens and take them back um, to the Great Botanical Gardens of Europe. The New York Horticultural Society, which uh, Hasek would be president of, did not get founded until well after the garden collapsed, his, his garden. Uh, fast forward to the Gilded Age. Botany, like many natural sciences in the United States, has become highly professionalized. The research university is on the rise. There are more and more departments, professional schools. Um, an arboretum has been founded at Harvard, uh, which of course drives the New Yorkers crazy because Boston did everything cultural first uh, before New York. Um, national professional botan botanical associations are emerging, so there are places where people come together, uh, professors are sharing findings and knowledge. There are journals being published finally, um, botany journals. There's an increase in funding for the pursuit of botany, not just for gen gentlemen. You could pursue it full time because you were paid to do it. Um, and there was, a, importantly, a differentiation of professional uh, of botany and medicine. Uh, so that botany now has more claim to being uh, a bona fide scientific field. It's not just the handmaking, handmaking of medicine. Uh, organizational resources. 
a massive change between Columbia's, uh, what Columbia could offer Hasek in the early 19th century and when it was in this building at this point, and uh, what it could offer Nathaniel Britton. You can see the rates of graduation here. 1,800 for the medical school, well, no one graduated. There were a couple of students involved. These are the people who were supposed to be paying Hasek uh, tuition. He was supposed to get tuition and support so he could teach in the garden. And there's no, there's a tiny, tiny class. Well, at Penn, there were uh, 50, 50 graduates in the 18th century. So Columbia's not doing so well yet. Um, enrollments are stagnant, and Columbia constantly goes to the legislature for loans. And as you might remember earlier, I said that one of the uh, one of the payments that Columbia gave when they were got when they were asking for a loan was. The state legislature did not have money or didn't want to vote money to give to Columbia, so they gave them 20 acres in the middle of Manhattan, which they bellyached about. We don't want land. We need money. What are we going to do with land? Um, uh, they complained uh, in many, many letters about why they had been given this useless piece of land that had a falling down conservatory on it and some overrun plants. 1890s, this is Columbia, this is Low, low Library today. Um, guess what, they made a killing off of David Hossack's land. One of the reasons, one of the key reasons they are so wealthy is this man's vision and his failure. So now Columbia, is extremely wealthy and it's uh, different, differentiated into many, many professional schools. There's an increase in enrollment, there's an increase in general college going that's benefiting uh, universities all across the country, uh, and there's greater tuition income. In this context, Columbia has much more to give Britain than Columbia had to give Classic. Uh, and the sad irony is that a lot of that money came from Classic, from Classic's. Um, another crucial difference is that the personal wealth in the early United States did not support uh, did not support this kind of project. The benevolent societies, the uh, the arts associations that were founded in the early republic, were founded with. Private subscription money. It was just just barely enough to keep these places going, and it was uh, for to pay for lectures. It wasn't to pay for giant conservatories, huge infrastructure, uh, plants uh, that needed to be uh, collected and cycled through different seasons. It was they were for much smaller, more modest organizations. Uh, the electoral politics in the late 1790s and early 1800s also worked against uh, Hasek, and by the time Britain was trying to found his, his organization, there were giant fortunes that had been made. Uh, there was uh, a desire, a strong desire on the part of uh, sections of the upper class in New York City to show that they were comparable in refinement to Boston and Philadelphia. Um, Washington wasn't considered yet a competition for New York. Um, and certainly with European capital, capitals. And many, many of these wealthy Americans were, of course, going to Europe collecting art, seeing what was valued in Europe, and coming back and founding institutions that would bring New York the kind of renown that these European capitals had. And so, the Museum of Natural History, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Metro sorry, that should not say the Museum of Opera, obviously, the Metropolitan Opera, the New York Public Library, all institutions being founded or being founded in the period when Hossett, when Britain was working. Um, there are organizational models now. And precisely the people who went to Cephalo's office that day to incorporate the New York Botanical Garden were working on these organizations. 
I didn't put Carnegie Hall up there. That was another one. J.P. Morgan was president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art for about 12 years. Um, <coughs> Carnegie, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller were all involved in the Metropolitan Opera. And um, the New York Public Library was founded with a great deal of money from three families, and then Carnegie gave another $5.2 million to the city to open branches. So all the same people are involved in building these organizations that Britain has working with these organizations. Finally, the material environment has changed dramatically. And this is an area that institutional entrepreneurship literature has looked at almost not at all. Um, it matters more for some projects than others, but this one it mattered tremendously. Um, you can see here that the New York, the, the part of New York that was settled, the 60,000 people, they all lived below Bleecker Street, basically. The rest of Manhattan was farms and estates. From the river, most of Manhattan looked like this. Big country house right on the edge, of, and then maybe some smaller farms and dwellings behind. But Manhattan was farms. That made it kind of hard to make an argument for people who, two people who didn't understand what a botanical garden was. Why, if we have farms, if we have grasses, if we have pastures everywhere, do we need a green space? Why do we need it? Well, this happens to be a snarky colleague of Kazakhs who knew full well why you needed a botanical garden. But he was very competitive with the Kazakh and very jealous of him. There were a lot of nasty things about Kazakh. And he says, public animosity is going to be aroused if we, uh, if we ask for money to put a fence around some of this farmland. We don't need it. Uh, it was quite dim disingenuous. I'm sure there's no politics like that around GW. Um, the, We're in Washington. We're in the they're, but they're outside the university. Around. <laughs> uh, all around uh, it, it was, you know, actually this does sound like um, So the material environment, even though it, it, it shouldn't have been an argument against this organization, it was, it influenced how people saw it. And certainly he was trying to take advantage of that. Uh, Gilded Age, this is a picture, a map of uh, Manhattan in around 1900. So Central Park has been created in the 1850s. We still have a little green space up there, but completely covered with buildings. The grid was laid out in the 18 teens. It was filled in gradually all the way up to the 1880s. Uh, in the 1880s, suddenly people are saying, why didn't we preserve more green space? Um, and the editor of the New York Herald, John Mullally, founded an organization called the New Parks Association. New York Parks Association to create great breathing spaces beyond the Harlem River. The Harlem River uh, is this little body of water up here, top of Manhattan. They filled up Manhattan, but they can see that with immigration and urban sprawl, it's going to spread. They need to create great breathing spaces. What do they do? They go to all the wealthy families and say, please help us lobby the politicians for the protection of the space because if we don't preserve it, we will work. And indeed, the Bronx Park land, the 250 acres that, had, that Britain had, that he got access to, came out of this Bronx movement. So the very elites who've made their fortunes industrializing, polluting, building real estate, et cetera, suddenly realized that they need to preserve land for, uh, for uh, hygiene reasons. There was a, that if, if immigrants, workers have <coughs> space to get out of their dense neighborhoods and relax and, um, and enjoy nature, that there would be potentially more illness and potentially social revolt. Um, so for, yes? Yeah. Does, does the print media, is that part of the material environment or that sort of the Because I noticed that the print media Folks, there's both the Harvest Weekly and the New York Times. And I assume that, I don't actually know when those were founded, but the ability to kind of get your word and talk about them. Well, I would say, you know, there were more there were more newspapers by the 1890s, but because New York was so tiny in the early 
republic, everybody was reading the same thing. I, I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't actually thought about that too hard, and I'm glad you raised that. But I, I, I think that because you can walk down the street and, and run into uh, some of the most powerful people in the nation, it was pretty easy to get the word out in, in print to exactly with these people. Um, but, I'll, but I'll think about that for a minute. Um, so, what, so what I want to argue out of this, all this historical detail, is that wasn't a failure. He wasn't untalented. He wasn't uh, not a visionary. He was everything that Britain was, but he wasn't living in the time that Britain was. And I think that if we continue to study successful cases of institutional entrepreneurship, just as if we study only successful cases of other kinds of entrepreneurship, we lose this analytical traction we get when we see that failure can have many of the same conditions and behaviors as success. Um, so what are the implications of this um, for us, institutional entrepreneurs and for those of us who study them and think they're really important in, in society? And when I'm done, I'd like, if we have time, to give you an example of a contemporary institutional entrepreneur. Um, I think the extent to which someone is truly entrepreneurial depends not so much on whether they're successful or not, but what they're working against. Britain was riding the tides of a number of macro-level processes that went, worked perfectly in his direction. He was savvy enough to see that, but he couldn't have set those in motion. And Hasek, by the same token, could not change the direction of American politics. He could not create personal fortunes at the drop of a hat to fund his organization. I think when we study success only, we misattribute. We run the risk of telling stories that are exciting and believable, uh, but not accurate. Reiterate the, yeah. One, one, one question comes to mind. I mean, at some point, when Steve Jobs stood down in Apple, people said. I knew somebody would write this. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the things people said, he was not only perfectly in his drive to success, but he was also very good at sometimes killing projects, saying, we don't do this, not the right time, not the right product. So at some point, it seems that, yes, Hosek recognized the problem, he was up against incredible odds, but where is the role of an entrepreneur to say this is not the right time for this project? Instead? He did finally. He did. He sold it to the state. He said, I can't, I can't do it. He did try two more times to get possession of the land back from the Columbia. Um, all the way into the 1830s, he was trying to In a way, he was trying to see, had the condi conditions changed enough now? He was watching his environment. Um, uh, I mean, it's, you can go either way, because of course we, we love the idea of the entrepreneur who doesn't give up, just perseveres against all the naysayers. Yeah, you want to jump in on this? Uh, yeah, um, because uh, it's easy to bring up the Steve Jobs, but um, who remembers the guy who started Pontiac, which disappeared? He was well before what happened, and nobody talks about him. But the market wasn't right there. There weren't enough people looking for him. Um, Bill Gates and his crew sat up there in Boston, and they had to have IBM come along. There were lots of people that were forming essentially DOS lookalikes, but they needed that IBM. Ross Perot couldn't have done anything if uh, IBM had not bundled. There were lots of people developing software companies and that sort of thing. But, um, so that whole issue of the environmental scan and that environmental uh, framework is absolutely crucial for an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, 
but it's the recognition of that that usually differentiates young people. And I would, I would like to just add that I, would, I think that when we're talking about business entrepreneurs, we're, we're usually encouraging students or, or watching Steve Jobs look at the industry. Steve Jobs is, we should need to talk about it. Um, Sorry, I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I should have had that with that. No, Steve. But um, I'm arguing that we also need to look at, as an entre institutional entrepreneurs in particular, um, and as people, if we're studying them, at much larger processes that might not fall into a sort of standard industry analysis. We need to look at larger uh, political, cultural trends. That doesn't mean that we can harness them. Uh, it doesn't always mean that we should harness them. And I, I would balk at the idea that we should try to, I know it happens in Washington, but uh, turn political processes in directions that help us with battles of money. Um, but I do think that as, as analysts of organizations, it's crucial, and for a whole host of other reasons to do with understanding the role that business can play in society, <coughs> it's crucial that we broaden our scope beyond an immediate field, organizational field or an immediate industry, or even a neighbor, neighboring industry. There were a bunch of hands. Um, you had your hand up before. Um, so you presented two cases for two different institutional logics. But my question is, what is the relationship between the micro and the macro levels? Because it seems that a set of microprocesses eventually lead to the macro institutional environment changing. So it, it seems like you can't study them as saying this is external to the micro process. It's, it's true. And, and when I mentioned that Hazek, Hazek's land actually ended up um, producing Columbia's wealth, that's the micro level working its way back up. Um, as sociologists, we're constantly struggling with this with this divide, which we try to conceptualize as a cycle, or a mutually constitutive process, or it's very hard to pull apart to study. Um, but what I've seen in the literature on institutional entrepreneurship, which I'm oriented towards here, is is an incredible narrowness of scope. What counts as macro in studying entrepreneurship in this literature is the immediate field or the next field over with a, a failure to examine, to re-embed those fields, those organizational fields, in cross-cutting social relations, political relations, um, cultural institutions. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to dance around the question because it's it's the one we've been struggling with since sociology was invented. And, and economists have been studying it since before then. Um. It seems like <clears throat> some of the arguments that you're making are pretty analogous to arguments that are made in the international business literature. Mm -hmm. um, in that there's sort of a growing area of international business is drawing exactly the same people in Maggio and Powell and Scott and so on. And this looking at differences in institutional environments mm -hmm. across countries. So really what you're doing is across time. Mm -hmm. And that literature looks across countries. But I think that there's a lot of similarities that can be drawn. The thing that, that um, I, I think it's framed a little bit differently. You're talking about different processes in different time periods. And that literature largely looks at differences in institutional environments. And actually, there's work on something called country institutional profiles that uses cognitive, normative, and regulatory environments and describes differences you know, between the United States and Britain. Mm -hmm. And sort of to, to, to show how entrepreneurship in general, I mean, there's not a ton of work on institutional entrepreneurship specifically, but just business processes, organizations' response to the environment depends on what those institutional environments look like. Yeah. And so... That sounds like a very critical... Yeah, so I think it's a nice collaboration. Actually, the person to look for that is Tatiana Sostrova. She's yeah. a person who's in there. Um, but I think a lot of what you're saying is just like right down that road of what's going on. Just looking at different... Across countries really or other across time. Thank you, I really appreciate that. I will connect us with that. And of course, coming out of the Maya yeah, because exactly. there's a lot of international business that's drawing exactly the same fundamental work. Okay. Um, I want to um, ask one, one more yeah. question, because I think this goes back to the question of macro and micro. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, so I asked a few minutes ago about what we were talking about the difference between macro and structural. Yeah. But that term structural from a sociologist's perspective is very specific to like the Harrison White networks and 
but isn't that kind of the link in some ways? Like macro level forces are kind of the, the institutional or or uh, you know rules of society kinds of forces, and then the structural are all of these things that kind of happen. You know? It depends which sociologist you're talking to, right? Yeah. I mean, for um, for for Gio, the, the structure is happening constantly right. on both levels. And this is a very particular use of structure, um, that might be a conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, but the, speaking of the micro and the macro, I wanted to end with this image, which is an, um, an artist's imagination. I believe I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to date this. It was unlabeled in the Columbia archives. Um, it, it certainly looks like it comes from the 1940s, um, 30s, 40s, depiction of Rockefeller Center. Um, and an artist imagined Hazek's conservatory. You can imagine when I found this, I was <laughs> the cover of my book. Um, but an artist imagined, of course this was gone by 1817, this, this building. But I love this image of Rockefeller Center shooting up out of this man's original vision. Um, you should really see the conservatory sort of pulverizing the process. Um, and when you go to Rockefeller Center today, there is, it took me a long time to find it. I had to move a bench for which a security guard berated me. Um, <laughs> there's a plaque that says, on this site was established the world famous Botanic Garden of David Hills. Um, so there were a bunch of hands. Yes? Yeah, I, uh, I applaud your uh, position of looking at failures uh, as opposed to just looking at successes because you always learn so much more from failures. But isn't it difficult to find comparable cases to, to make the kind it's of It's terribly, terribly difficult. Um, it's a problem that uh, in social entrepreneurship literature people are struggling with. Uh, people really want to, to understand how how social problems are can can be alleviated. And the Ashoka Foundation has made a you know, 20, 30 year project now of trying to understand what creates real lasting social change. Um, and finally we're starting to have syntheses, efforts to to actually examine organizations that not that have failed completely, but that are not as successful in, in, in delivering their mission. Um, but yes, it's very hard, and, and even in, in my sample of two, it's, it's hard to, they're, they're yeah, yeah, um, it is tough, and of course the failures disappear, and we don't learn about them, um, and David Hasek is gone, I stumbled across him because I thought, well, there's a botanical garden in four or five boroughs in, in New York right now, why isn't there a botanical garden in Manhattan? And, and I looked into it, and this is why. Um, I thought that would make a neat book, the five, five botanical gardens in Manhattan, but then I realized that this is a fascinating story, um, the one that's gone, um, and maybe I'm drawn to it earlier. Well, and my last book was a study of a wild success, um, you know, the Paris Opera, which of course still, still goes on, but um, it, is, it is very hard to study failure, and it's much more fun to study success. Um, I, I want to just leave you with um, an institutional entrepreneur I studied in Thailand last year. Um, I went to Thailand on the, um, the Goldman Sachs uh, program to, uh, it's called 10,000 Women, and it's a study of, uh, it's an attempt to, to collect information on women entrepreneurs in developing countries. And I was invited to conduct one of these studies, and I decided to pick uh, a social entrepreneur, um, and uh, and I put that in quotes because she would probably call herself an environmental activist, but she is an Ashoka Fellow. Uh, she's also the daughter of an Ashoka Fellow, uh, which is, her mother was an Ashoka Fellow, which is very, very rare. Um, and she works on every single level of Thai society, from the level of villagers uh, using uh, village knowledge about what's happening in, um, in Thai river ecosystems 
to translate that into the kind of expert knowledge, what looks like expert knowledge, university researchers help the villagers translate that into the kind of knowledge that looks familiar to policymakers. So she works with the villagers, she works with the press, she works with university researchers, she is also an advisor to the Thai Senate. And she is working at every single level of Thai society, trying to effect institutional change around the treatment of rivers and thinking about rivers in, uh, in, in Thailand and Southeast Asia. Um, whether she will be the, the success or the, the failure, I mean, one way to, to study this is to keep an eye on people uh, as, they're, as they're working and see what happens. Of course, we don't get the, the, quite the longitudinal perspective um, that, that we might want. Um, but these institutional entrepreneurs are working throughout, throughout the world, uh, I think, trying to understand the conditions that, that lead to their success is, is, is not only fascinating intellectually, but it's, it's, it's crucial. Well, thank you for your great presentation. Is there a quick question? I, I don't know if it's relevant to your research or not, but I wonder if you um, had considered the, the social network that those two samples had in their times, and in return that you can attribute the success or failure of these um, entrepreneurs. So you mean more, more technically mapping their social network? Because I talk informally about their networks and their mm -hmm. um, because you know, you, you already talked about binding yeah. uh, to some powerful institutions and other parties, so it can be relevant. Yeah, it could be, and I think um, the question would be, how how technical do you need to get in mapping that? What do you get? That I've seen a lot of historical studies that go to great lengths to collect very difficult to collect structural data, network data. Um, and don't actually learn, teach us that much more than you could figure out. Uh, by doing sort of more conventional historical arch archival interpretive research on the same materials. Um, I'll get a grad student to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was another, yeah. Yeah, um, I was going to say, I think it's fascinating to recognize that failure and success can, can look the same, that the characteristics can be the same, but beyond recognizing that and, and knowing what the macro level processes are, what can contemporary entrepreneurs do to, beyond knowing what is the right place in the right time? If you do know the right place in the right time, you are way ahead of Right, which I, I guess my point too is like yeah. it's so hard to know what is the right yeah. place in the right time. Yeah, I mean this, you know, is, this is where I kind of just feel humble before the complexity of the social world. Um, I think there, uh, there are There are things you cannot harness. There are things you cannot know. There are processes that, that are worth studying that we still cannot tame. Um, I think it's, it, it depends entirely on the, the project that you're engaged in. Um, whether uh, a very thoroughgoing multi-level attempt to understand your social world is actually going to help you in your particular entrepreneurial project. Um, I think there are other citizenship reasons to engage in that kind of learning and study anyway. Um, but there's no magic bullet. Yeah. Although, I, I mean, just reflecting on today, and maybe this is just making too much out of this, it strikes me that the depressing analogy or the depressing part of the story is that the kingmakers are more important than the, than the kings themselves, right? So like in Britain's time, it's much more important to have Vanderbilt and Rockefeller and Morgan in his, in his corner than to have Jefferson and Hamilton and Adams in the earlier story. And so like it, it could be a story that's sort of about how like the back it's room, so the mahogany. depressing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, isn't that, I mean, that strikes me as, like, really, I mean, so you paint a picture of the complexity of the institutional landscape, and I I think I agree wholeheartedly that, you know, the institutional context is crucial, but it is really striking that, the, it, I mean, in our history, we think of, like, Hamilton, Jefferson, and Adams as being, like, 
people who made this country, but the reality is that you know, maybe the people who made things happen in the world. Well, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little historical tidbit. Um, David Hasek wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson in 1806 <coughs> saying, I'm so excited about that expedition that's coming back. Lewis and Clark. Um, that was so cool that you sent that out. Um, I have an idea for somebody who could go next time, and you should send him to these places because we really need to learn about those areas of the United States. Um, and by the way, could you please establish a system of botanical gardens across the United States? <laughs> um, Jefferson wrote back, and we have the letter, it's here at the Library of Congress. And he wrote back, um, and he said, what a wonderful project. I'm so pleased to see the guide to your botanical garden in New York. Hasek had sent the catalog. And, um, I wish you all the best in your endeavors. <laughs> <laughs> it just was not, Jefferson could have made it happen. He was president. He, he could have, okay, it was the lead up to the, there was embargoes, and it was the lead up to the War of 1812. There was a lot else occupying him. There's a lot else occupying New York politicians. Um, there's a version of my story where you could argue, well, Hasek just wasn't persuasive enough. Um, but I think, I, I think I want to say that Jefferson could have made it happen. <coughs> but he just had bigger fish to fry at the time. That is my, it's not all that bad <laughs> version. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to defend Jefferson a little bit. He's, he's sitting there as president of um, the rural agrarian society. It is not industrialized. It is not um, uh, full of metropolitan areas and cities. In 1880, that's changed, or it, it changed radically. So he's sitting looking at an altogether different world. Um, my thing is that both of these guys have the same value proposition, both of them. And one is just so out of the social, economic, and political sphere that it just had no, <coughs> no legs to it. The other one came at the right time and was at a time when people were thinking that way. So I, d I wouldn't blame Jefferson. I mean, Jefferson was a... It wasn't was even a, on his radar screen. Well, Jefferson was a devoted naturalist himself, of course, and had gone to many European botanical gardens, but it just was not, it didn't have the urgency that, that, uh, that Britain could move on. Okay, are we out of time? I mean, we're more questions. Uh, uh, you, you, know, you don't know the personalities, but if you see the, the people that you're engaging in the conversation with are the IB and the management professor and entrepreneur. And there are finance and decision sciences and some accountancy faculty that's been waiting for. The next slide is the numbers or the equations. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they never showed up. There are, there are a couple of numbers, though. Yeah, we, I, 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 I have to tell you, when you said samples, when you said sample size two, Refik opened up his own paper. <laughs> and then when you said this is the uh, last slide, uh, Del Key left. Uh, so, uh, and for us, uh, and you, it's in education, obviously we do respect immensely to the sociology and all, all our colleagues areas, but for us there is a research question here. At the end of the presentation, we look at this and we say, okay, so what you're trying to say is from now on when you change this parameter, actually you predict so-and-so, or the model will uh, do a little better in terms of its significance, so that kind of. But, uh, and it's a naive question for your area. But is this, a, now you do all this research, a, a great one, I, as a matter of fact, I listened to it very carefully from the beginning to end, very interesting. But do, can you say at the end of this, like in organizational studies, from now on when we look at whether the institutional entrepreneurs are going to be successful. It's not only whether they identify the problem and opportunity and buy the stakeholders, but also the fifth item comes in here, say, their ability to recognize the macro uh, effects or the, the environment or the time and that thing. Would that justify such an addition to the literature? Or do you say, no, not only one paper, wait until I finish my book. I, I mean, yeah. So I'm, I'm waiting for it. Okay. So, um, one, the book's going to be a great read, a page turner. Um, <laughs> look for it. Um, 
When I study a single case or two cases and delve into this history, my goal is to, uh, from, from the point of view of what's the contribution of theory uh, or to my field. Because I wrote about the Paris Opera. There is not one sociologist who actually cares about the Paris Opera. And I wrote my book knowing that um, uh, there might be a couple of opera fans, but there's no one who, as a professional uh, interest, cares about the Paris Opera or botanical gardenry that works, I think, um, from that point of view. I pick these cases and study them, one, because I adore delving into these historical details for reasons I don't know. Um, but two, theoretically, the contribution, my, what I see my role as in my field um, is exploring particular cases that open up new avenues. They don't lead to predictability, to generalizability. They open up theoretical avenues that the people who publish in administrative science literally or organization science run with and quantify and try to broaden across a large sample. It's not, I don't see it as my job, it's not my strength, it's not my love, it's not my passion, uh, but there is a role in the field for this kind of research, and it's happily it's recognized, or else I would be. Yeah. Um, right. Skinner said all you need is n equals one, <laughs> and you can write a whole uh, theory and a whole series of laws. All you need is uh, n one equals one, and one equals <laughs> yeah. Be all the red I forgot. <laughs> 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 Why do you always pick on accountants? <laughs> accountants can't ask questions. <laughs> um, so let me just say thank you, Victoria. This oh, was an yes. amazingly so interesting. <laughs> and, uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, this is the first of many of these this year, and um, I hope I'm looking forward to many more uh, stimulating and exciting theoretical and empirical conversations over the next several months. Thank you.